in our service where we're going to think about Jesus, focus our hearts on Jesus, and we're going to prepare to take the communion. I'm going to open up here with the scripture in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve to masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the chance and opportunity to come here and to worship you freely this morning. There are so many people in the world who who can't do this, who don't have the freedom or the opportunity or the chance to do this, God, but we can come together with a body of believers and sing your praise. We can read your scripture, God. We We can live your word without any hindrance or persecution. And I pray that we can take advantage of that, God. Uh, that you can move me aside this morning, allow your word and your spirit to impact and convict and to lift the hearts that are in this room so that we can see you clearly and that we can follow in your steps. We love you so much. We thank you for this time in your son Jesus' name. We pray all these things. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, It's good to be here. It's good to be back. I don't know if you've been tuning in, but if you have, uh, it has not been me up here for the last two weeks. Uh, Dom preached an awesome sermon last week. I think Dom's in the room. Let's give Dom a round of applause. He's out there serving the campus ministry. He was picking up a friend of his, so he's on his way. Oh, there he is. I I see him now. Um, And then the week before that, we had Kyle Saxon, and Kyle came, and he preached a great sermon during Campus Swap. Uh, Both of those guys did uh, incredible. If you missed those sermons or if you missed any of the sermons, I want to encourage you, go back and listen to them. Right, Because we don't write these things in a vacuum, and we're not getting up here just to do a dance for you so that on Sunday morning you can be entertained. But all of these sermons are working together towards the development of this congregation and each individual disciple in here. Uh, So I I would ask, you know, even if you can't make it on a Sunday morning or you happen to miss a Sunday morning, please go back and listen to the sermons. Uh, The the Holy Spirit is guiding us in a specific direction, and and we who get up here and and, and speak, we're trying to help us get in line with that. Amen. So Dom started a series last week called The Third Soil, and his first sermon was Trading Life for Worries. You know, he talked about how Jesus cares for us above all else. And that we can find sustenance and safety and peace within the arms of God. And therefore, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about material things in this world. But I think oftentimes, uh, when we have a, a sermon series, there can be the thought, why is this what we're deciding to focus on? Right? What is the point of this sermon series? As you know, you know, we, we've, you know, our new vision and mission statement, you know, communion, character, community, and all the sermon series are going to reflect that throughout the year. And right now, these sermons are all about helping us with that character C, helping us become the people that God wants us to be. The, the point of these sermons are to help us to examine the parts of ourselves that are not like Jesus and to rectify those things. You know, and we, we, we began with the old God series talking generally about idolatry, but moving on from there, one of the things that I have observed is that one of the most dangerous traps of the old gods is the third soil. You know, in the parable about the third soil, Jesus said there are three things that get us caught up in the trap of the third soil. He says the worries of this life, which Dom talked about last week, He says, 
the deceitfulness of wealth, and he says the desire for other things. The deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is The Third Soil, Part 2, Mammon Rising. You know, I did campus ministry for eight years. Um, I was converted in the team ministry. I became a Christian in the team ministry. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it is such that when you get to the campus ministry, there's just a lot of freedom there and a lot of you figuring out how to be a disciple on your own time in campus ministry. Uh, and let me say this, campus ministry is a false environment, okay? What I mean by that is there's never going to be a time in your life again where you have the amount of free time and flexibility and friends in proximity to you that you do in campus ministry. And I would argue that it, campus ministry creates uh, an environment that is extremely conducive to discipleship. If you know anything about the history of our movement, our movement started from a campus ministry movement. You had a whole bunch of people who were sold out for Jesus who took advantage of the freedom that they had in their campus years, and they caught a dream to take the gospel to the rest of the world. Why am I sharing that? Well, a lot of people, a lot of guys my age, a lot of my peers, and, and, and guys a few years older than me, when it comes to campus ministry, they love campus ministry. Because it is a place where you're going and you get to encounter the youth and you get to encounter people who are excited and, and they have their whole lives before them and they're discovering Jesus and you're together all the time and you're baptizing people and it's like this great adventure and it's an amazing time. And there are a lot of people, a lot of ministers, I think, they think Man, that's where the world has changed. And it's true, I think God certainly does use campus ministry to change the world. But as I got older and as I, as I was a campus minister for long enough, what I started to realize is that one of my greatest faults, you know, what we've talked a lot over the last year and a half about how the church was in an unhealthy spot. And as I thought about it, I'm like, well, how did I contribute to that, Right? Uh, because, you know, when we, when we have conversations like that, you know, the truth is, you know, the whole congregation is at fault, but the leaders are at fault as well, right? Uh, the entire time the church was getting in an unhealthy spot, I was one of the guys on staff. So somehow I contributed to this in some way. And how? And as I've, I've thought about it, I thought, oh, it's because when I was in campus ministry, I had my blinders on, man. I was so focused on the campus that I wasn't looking at the rest of the church, and one day I looked around, five years, six years into being in campus ministry, seven years, and I started to talk with my peers, guys who were my age in campus ministry with me, but they had moved on for several years at that point, when I realized that they were not in a good spot. They lacked direction. They lacked vision. They lacked any kind of spiritual ambition. In fact, the mantra was, look, we just need to survive and keep going to church and tithing. And some people, they wouldn't even come to church no more. And it, it, it made me really start to think. And, and here's the deal. I think when we, when we get up here and we preach and we talk about Jesus and we talk about discipleship, we talk about what Jesus has called us to, what we're talking about is a lifestyle, not just a belief system. And I think a lot of times we can obsess ourselves with the idea of salvation, but not the idea of really submitting our day-to-day -to, -day to living like Jesus. We call ourselves disciples, but do we actually practice the disciplines that Jesus practiced, that Jesus taught? And the third soil, right, what it does is it, it, is it chokes that lifestyle out. What it makes us do is it makes us forget what we're here to do. It makes us forget how we're supposed to behave. It makes us forget that we're supposed to be on fire taking the word of God to the rest of the world. We're supposed to be doing something. You can't be a Christian if you're not doing anything. But America teaches us that, no, the goal is to get what you need so you don't have to do anything. My fear, I'm just going to be open with you guys, right, is that my generation, 
and I'm going to say a little bit older and a little bit younger. Let's say 45 to 25. That's the generation that's going to determine the next 10 to 20 years of this church. You know, we got a lot of uh, mature Christians in here. We got a lot of disciples that have been in here for a long time, that have been here 10, 20, 30 years. You guys paved the way. You brought us to where we are. You, you, you did the thing. You lived the life. You, you are an example for us. And, and the truth is, as much as we still need you to reach down and to teach us and to give you your wisdom, right, like the young men and women are the ones who should be on the front lines. That generation, 45 to 25, again, that's a relatively arbitrary number. Maybe it's a little bit older. Maybe it's a little bit younger. But that generation, the destiny of this congregation is on our shoulders. And my fear is that that generation is just stuck, bleeding out in the third soil. So as I preach this, that's the primary generation I'm talking to. Now listen, I'm talking to everybody. Right? The Holy Spirit is going to say something to everybody. But as we talk and as I get into the scriptures, I'm challenging my generation. Because if we don't move, here's the deal. The Holy Spirit will continue to, but he don't mind leaving us behind. He don't need us. He wants us. And we cannot be entitled to the power and impact that he is going to have. We need to hop on the train. So that is why we're here talking about the third soil. I fear that one of Satan's primary schemes is to keep the church ineffective and unproductive by using the third soil. So this sermon series is designed to do three things. One, help us to understand the trap. Two, help us to escape the thorns. And three, help us to thrive in the good soil. And last week, Dom talked about how to escape our anxieties and worries. This week, I'll be talking about the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. Like I said, this is the third soil, part two, mammon rising. And that is my first point, mammon rising. Matthew 6, let's go back there in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, in your translation, it probably says you cannot serve both God and money, but the Aramaic word used here for money is mammonas or mammon, okay? It's only used four times in the New Testament. And the difference between that word and other words that mean treasure or wealth or riches is that this word emphasizes the personification of the idea. What I mean by that is mammon is a word that means avarice or greed deified. Or wealth personified into an entity that is in opposition to God. Because of this word and its emphasis, scholars and translators for years have assumed that Mammon was an ancient deity, an old God trying to stake his claim in the world today. But if you go do some study, you go in the Old Testament, you're not going to find this God Mammon. He's not in the Old Testament. I, I do think he exists in some of our Old Testaments. I do think he's an old God that some of us worship before we made Jesus Lord. And I do think that even as disciples, this love of money, this deity, this God, Mammon, is still a God that we wrestle with today. I think Mammon is hungry for our attention. 
I think the love of money wants to be full on our souls. He is wealth and greed personified. He is powerful enough to enslave us. He is strong enough to force us into voluntary servitude. Voluntary. We are willing to serve this beast. He is one of the greatest and strongest of the old gods, and I think he is one of the great lords of the third soil. And again, I'm talking here about the love of money. And I think this is difficult for us. It's difficult for me. We live in a society that's entire framework is money. A lot of things can be solved in this world with enough money. Money can very easily posture itself as the solution to the worries of this life. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Where are we going to live? What are we going to wear? Matthew 6 teaches us that the Lord takes care of these things. But the world tells us that mammon takes care of these things. And this creates in us a tension, a a kind of cognitive dissonance, right? We trust that God provides, but money seems to be paying the bills. How do we live with that? Right? And I think that mammon has risen risen in each of our hearts as a viable option to living well. We see him as a viable option. You know, and I think it's funny. uh, Somebody told me, uh, Vadi Bakum, he's a he's a preacher out there. I haven't listened to a lot of this stuff, but they quoted they quoted him, and he and he said that if you allow Rome to raise your children, don't be surprised when they worship Caesar. And I I I think about that quote, and that (laughs) that makes me like, oh my god, I think I'm going to homeschool. Like I I don't I, I don't know what to do about my kids right now, but 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 all of us. We're all, most of us actually are raised first by the world. Like, you know, maybe our parents were disciples and awesome, and maybe they poured into us. Maybe they didn't. Maybe our parents weren't even present. What I can tell you is a lot of us, that we grew up with, with learning how to live in the world. And as disciples, it's like we want to give our entire selves to Jesus, but we also want to function in society. We want to be a a part of our culture, and not even in a sinful way, but literally just in a, you know, we want to operate normally. And I I, I think this, again, this this leads to a lot of tension. It leads to a lot of us, uh, it leads us to that decision that I was talking about a few weeks ago, right? We could be entirely countercultural like Jesus calls us to be and just sell everything, and be like, bump it, I'm going to be a person that solely lives on faith. The Lord's going to take care of me. But we all know, like, they ain't going to fly in America. Ain't nobody going to listen to you. You're probably not going to smell good. You're going to look like a crazy man on the street, maybe not eating locusts and honey, but eating something just as weird in America. That doesn't fly here. So then the other option is, okay, we're not, if we don't give up everything, how do we submit everything to Jesus? And again, there's that tension Because within that valley of decision, it's very easy to begin to worship mammon. Earthly riches and money are not the answer to life. How do we know this? Because the problem with life is not the lack of things. It's the lack of one thing, and that is God. There are multiple stories in the Bible with guys who had a lot. Lot had a lot. How did his life end up? Right? Abraham had a lot, and he went through a lot of trials and tribulations. Right? I I often think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who they were literally in the worst physical situation you could be in. They got thrown into a furnace. Like, that, that, (laughs) it logically doesn't even make sense to us. But the problem wasn't that they were in the furnace The problem is that without God, they would have been burned up in the furnace. With God, everything makes sense and everything is taken care of. Paul teaches us. He says, I have learned the secret 
to being content in any and every situation. He says, whether I'm rich or poor, hungry or full, he teaches us that even though we lack things, we can, we can lack being rich, we can still be content and joyful. We can still be satisfied because of the presence of God and the power of the kingdom. So this leads me to a few quick subpoints that I want to touch on in this point specifically. Uh, these subpoints are going to help us hopefully untangle ourselves from the thorns of wealth. First, I just want to let everybody know and understand that wealth is deceitful. Wealth is deceitful. What does that mean? Well, wealth does not bring joy. It doesn't bring life. It brings a comfort that leads to complacency. Okay, so wealth does bring comfort. I would be lying if I didn't say that, right? But the kind of comfort that wealth leads to is a comfort that brings about complacency, teaches us to, to not be workers in the harvest field. We become workers for ourselves, and when we get what we need, we sit down on the couch and we try very hard not to move from that spot. Right? My daughter's learning how to do that, and I, I don't like it. I'm trying to teach her not to do it, but if she's sitting on that couch, she'd be like, Daddy, give me a snack. Daddy, give me my water. Hey, look, her water be on the table two feet in front of her. She legit does not want to get off. The, and I look at her, and I have to teach her, Margo, God gave you legs. You use them. She gets mad at us, but now she has to get up and get whatever she wants. Um, but, you know, I, I look at her, and I'm like, yep, that's my daughter. That's exactly what I want to do with my life. Uh, you know, just being honest, just being open. Wealth is deceitful. It's the cornerstone of a society that is in opposition to God. Wealth is also empty. Like, it literally doesn't exist. Think about it. Gold is just a rock. Diamonds, they're just rocks. Now, they may be rare, but human beings have decided to kill each other for millennia over rocks. All right, well, let's say, well, we don't trade by, you know, rocks anymore. We use paper, right? We, okay. So that means for millennia, human beings, or maybe centuries now, human beings have killed each other over paper. You say, okay, well, we don't use paper anymore. We, we use digital stuff. We got credit cards. Okay. So for the past few decades, human beings have decided to kill each other over plastic and digital code. It doesn't exist. And the Bible talks about this, that we take stone and wood and we carve idols out of them. We don't think about it like that. We worship things that are literally powerless, right? Isn't that what inflation is? Some about the value of gold? I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm not an economics guy. But what I do know is even normal society is recognizing how not valuable the dollar is, how empty the dollar is. And oftentimes, the more money you have, the more you need, right? I feel like I have a lot, okay? I feel like I'm living the dream right now. And I don't, I don't I, well, in, in, in the view of the world, I think I make a lot of money. I think in view of some of you guys, I probably don't make a lot of money. But sometimes I'll think to myself, like, what would I do with 10,000 more dollars? And I literally think, I have no idea. I only need, like, 3,000 more. <laughs> That's all I need. And I'd, be, and I'd be real straight. I could actually go on vacation at some point, you know what I'm saying? Right now, you know, eating out, you know, we go to McDonald's, like, we're going big today. <laughs> but I think if I had $10,000 more, what would I do? And my dad said, look, you'll find a way to spend it. Everybody does. The more we have, the more we'll spend. Why is that? We can never get enough, can we? That's how you know it's empty. You keep eating, you keep eating, but you're never full. Also, finally, this last little subpoint: wealth is a tool. It is a means to an end, not an end. It is no different from a car or a hammer. It has a specific function. But a lot of us see it as the goal. We have a decision to make. That is, to use our wealth and riches either for the glory of God and his kingdom or for our own desires. 
And it's that decision right there, right? How will we use the blessings that God gives us? It's that question that I think is deeply important to who we are as Christians, and that leads me into my second point, squandered inheritance. Squandered inheritance. Luke 15, verse 11. Now, I'm going to start in verse 11, but this is, uh, you know, the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. That you got an older son and a younger son. The younger son comes to the father and he says, give me my uh, share of the inheritance early, father. His father's like, all right, here you go. The guy takes all his money and he goes and it says that he squanders it in wild living. Wastes everything. He's eaten out of a pig pen. He realizes, I would be better off back in service to my father, in my father's house, than out here eating pig gloop, right? So he, he goes back home, and his father's extra excited. His father's about to throw a party. And here in verse 11, it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, sorry, but, yeah, sorry, but he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never obeyed, disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends but when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Let me just say that phrase again, and we'll go on. But he says, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. So, parables. Parables aren't about you, right? You probably learned that before in some exegesis class. Jesus wasn't like, you know, let me think about Dom Camerino and write a parable about him. Parables are about very specific things, and they have very specific points. A lot of the parables, most of the parables were pointing out the entitlement of the Jews, how they believed that they were God's one and only people, but how they had actually not been the people of God that they needed to be and how God was going to open the kingdom to other people, right? That's the difference here between the older brother and the younger brother. But as Christians, the same rotten heart that the Jews developed is the same kind of rotten heart that Christians can develop because that rotten heart comes from the entitlement of thinking, I'm God's person, I'm God's people, Right? And if it was the Jews back then, it's, it, it, then it's the Christians today. So that means the lessons that Jesus is trying to teach the Jews are the lessons that we need to learn as Christians. We love reading this scripture and being like, yeah, we're the younger brother. No, we're not. If, if you're a Christian, you're not the younger brother. But let's go on. Something about this parable jumped out to me. As I was developing the sermon, at the very beginning, the younger brother asked for his portion of the estate, right? He asked for his inheritance early. He wanted it early. And I don't think we often think about this. But I think that the attitude of the younger brother is the general spirit of society. We all want the blessings of God. Whether that be spiritual or material. We all want the blessings of God as soon as humanly possible. Like, God, you know, give me that good job, right? God, give me that raise. God, give me that new car. My wife and I need this, or we need that, right? God, give us the money to just do this much more. How often have we prayed for those things? God, give me this promotion. We all want the blessings of God early. And that's all the brother was asking for. He's like, look. Just, just give me it all right now. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Why would it be bad to recognize that our God is a good, good father? 
and that he wants to lavish on us blessing after blessing after blessing. I don't think it's ridiculous to ask him for those blessings. My kids certainly don't think so. They wake up in the morning, they look at me and they say, Candy, you're not going to get candy in the morning. And they have no shame in asking for exactly what they want. But we should have no shame in asking what we want from God. It's not a bad thing. Don't clap just yet. (laughs) The blessings of God are not a bad thing, but it's what we do with those blessings where the problem comes in. It's what we do with those blessings that can get us into trouble. And what did the younger brother do with his blessing? He, he, he got good things, and he used them to get as far away from his father as possible. Let's not even talk about the squandering it yet. He got his blessing. He got his good things. He got his material wealth, like we're all asking for. Don't kid yourself. I know you do. I was praying the other day. God, let me get some more money. He was like, nah. All right. (laughs) He didn't answer that prayer yet. He got his material wealth, and he got as far away from his father as humanly possible. And then, and then he squandered his wealth. Or the King James said he wasted his substance. I love that. His substance. He wasted what mattered. The Greek squander literally means to scatter or disperse, to throw sand or grain with reckless abandon to the wind. You can never gather it again. God blessed him, but he ruined the blessing. He chased the old gods. He chased comfort. He chased satisfaction, obviously missing the point that those things ultimately came from his father. Many of us pray for material blessings, wealth, and riches, and societal success. And amen. I'm not telling you not to do those things. Because all of those things can be used for the glory of God. But how are you using your wealth and riches? That's my question. How are you using them? Jesus said you cannot serve two gods, right? Let's all ask ourselves the question, right? At the end of our life, who will say, well done, good and faithful servant? Will it be Jesus or will it be mammon? Think about it. Who are you serving? But I don't think that's the gut punch of this scripture. The parable gives this man a redemption story. Right? The younger brother is not the bad guy here. And I think each of us can make very simple and easy decisions today to redeem the way that we use our wealth and our riches. Here's just a few easy decisions that we can make. One, we can tithe. We can give financially to God and his church. And let me say this. There are some of us who do not do that. There are some of us who do not understand generosity, who do not, who do not understand this act of worship, some of us who do not understand stewardship. And you know who you are. You know exactly who you are. And I would argue Not doing this, not making this easy decision is just one of the ways that we serve mammon. So if you ask yourself the question, who's going to be praising me at the end of my life and you don't give to the church? It may be mammon who will be praising you in the end. Tithing is just a very easy way. Give to the kingdom 
first. Another, give to the poor, both in your congregation and outside of your congregation. Don't be stingy with your wealth. Look for ways. Look, if God is a God who lavishes blessings upon people indiscriminately, right? We want to judge people all the time. Well, no, nah, I joke. You know, he ain't, he ain't a member. Of the, he ain't a member of the church. I ain't going I ain't gonna give that money. To, I don't know what he's gonna do with it. <laughs> you know, hey, God knows what you're gonna do with his money. He still gives it to you, and you still mess it up. God gives indiscriminately. Why? Because he's a generous God. We're supposed to be God's images. We're supposed to live like him, do what he does. We should be lavishing. Our, now, look, don't be foolish. God got enough to do that, right? You got $50 in your bank account. Don't go and give 49 to a homeless person because you're trying to be like Jesus, right? Actually, <laughs> there's biblical precedent for doing that, right? <laughs> now that I think about it. It's funny, even the ways we talk about wisdom when it comes to money, man, it's very worldly wisdom. It, it never leans towards faith. I love what Matt Gilpin was saying, that giving is ultimately about faith. Faithful people do amazing things for God. So give, or tithe, give. Here's another thing. Reject excess. Right? Reject excess. What I mean by that is God calls us to a, a relative life of simplicity. And, and one of the primary ways that we know there's a love of money or a love of material things, if we just look filthy rich, right? We have so many things that we just don't need. Now, I'm not necessarily like, I, I honestly don't think there's anybody in our church that does that. If you think you do, amen, uh, you know, shake your heart, read your Bible, you know, um, but I, I think, you know, there's, this, there's, a, there's an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. And you got these mega churches, right, with these preachers who their lives are so lavish. And they have these giant houses and the, and the shoes that cost $10 million. And I'm like, you can buy knockoff shoes that look just like that for 10 bucks. You know what I'm saying? Nobody cares, you know? Um, Reject excess, right? Seek to live a more simple life. Be hospitable, right? If you have a home, make it a light. And, and finally, just live wildly towards God. And I, I love how the scripture talks about he went in wild living and squandered his wealth. I want us to be creative. Look, if we have a lot of wealth and riches, be creative and wild and, and, and just imaginative about how you use your wealth and your riches to build God's kingdom. You could go anywhere. You could do anything. You could serve anyone. You could start a foundation here or orphanage there or I don't know. You know, you could pay for a whole group of people when you're walking to a Starbucks. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But use your worldly wealth to win people to Jesus. These are just some ways, some ways we can make some specific decisions to have the same redemption story that the younger brother had. These are easy decisions. The scary part comes next. Because even the world can understand what I just said about the younger brother. But as Christians, our fate, like I said, is more often the fate of the older brother. Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 13. It says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of, the, uh, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, which is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. The, the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. It's a piece of our inheritance. It's the piece of our inheritance that we get early, just like the younger brother asked for. Okay? The scary truth about the parable of the prodigal son is that both brothers squandered their wealth. Both brothers squandered their inheritance. The younger squandered his material inheritance, but his soul was saved because that was just money and riches. When it was gone, when he ran out, he understood how deceitful it had been. And he went back to the place of life. 
The older brother, though, sat in the midst of his inheritance the whole time, but he did nothing with it. He had all the glory, all the power, all the goodness of his father's kingdom around him, yet he wasted it all. He sat idle for years. His brother might have been in wild living, but he was sitting in dead complacency, one that rotted not his wealth, but his soul. The Christian runs this risk, but a million times over. Why? Because God has given us his Holy Spirit. That is the most valuable thing that exists in the universe. It's the thing that makes a human the richest that they can be. But what are we doing with that inheritance of the Holy Spirit? What are you doing with that insane amount of wealth that you have? This is something we all need to think about. And I'm not talking to, to the non-Christian right now. If, you're, if you've not decided to make Jesus Lord, I, I want to emphasize how good it is to have the Spirit. And I want to challenge you to study the Bible, figure out what that means. Give your life to Jesus. I'm talking to the family today. Those of us who have made the decision. And like I said, I'm talking to everybody, but I'm talking to my generation. Because we're the ones who are in the most danger of this. How much sense does it make to have the Holy Spirit, but to squander him? To waste him? To take him like a handful of sand and throw him to the wind? How much sense does it make to ignore him? The ways he's trying to transform you, turn you into being more like Jesus. The ways he's trying to move you, trying to teach you how to think and how to speak, how to treat other people, how to love well, how to bring about the kingdom, how to act like his son. How much sense does it make to ignore him, to squash him down, to grieve his goodness and power? Church, this is the ultimate effect of the third soil. It's not just that the thorns squeeze the growth out of us. It's that they lull us into a spiritual sleep, a quiet rebellion that rejects the impact of the Holy Spirit. For some of us, the danger of the third soil is not simply worshiping mammon. It's burying the Holy Spirit in the casket of our earthly bodies so that he does not see the light of day and therefore the world will not see the light of God through us. Are you squandering your spiritual inheritance today? We each need to examine our lives we need to examine our day-to-day. -day. We need to examine how we spend our time, how we behave, how we speak, how we think. We need to examine how we treat people, our spouses, our children, our roommates, people who don't look like us or have the same life experiences, the poor and the needy, the disabled. We need to examine it all and ask ourselves, are we squandering the inheritance of the Holy Spirit? And this, this isn't an ethereal question that I'm asking, right? Because a lot of us, we know about the sins of commission. We're like, I'm not out doing that and this. I'm not out in wild living yet, but you might be sitting in the house of God doing nothing. Or even more than that, some of the sins that you have, you feel like they're justified. Right? In the, in the privacy of your own home, how you treat your children, how you treat your spouse, the things that you say or, or the thoughts that you think, are you actually yielding to the Holy Spirit? Or are you just using the Holy Spirit to justify, again, your ridiculous, sinful actions because you feel entitled? 
I got them now. I can do whatever I want. And if that means I don't feel like doing anything, I can do that too. That's not how the kingdom works. And you shouldn't be surprised on Judgment Day where Jesus is like, I don't know who you are. You're like, yeah, but I went to church, right? I went to D group, right? I did a community service that Perry asked me to from the pulpit. It's like, guys, it's the bare minimum. Are you actually living like Jesus? Are you actually letting the Holy Spirit transform you? Or are you burying him in the tent of your earthly body? Are we sitting with the presence of Christ in us? Are we sitting among the house of the living God, but not being transformed by him? Not living in accordance with his way and his will. If we do not repent from this, we may find great comfort here in this world for the small amount of time that we will be here. But we will find great discomfort for eternity. It's time that we escape the third soil and truly respect the house of God. My third point, the house of God. I want to read, I want to end here by reading a few psalms. I, I think the problem with serving mammon and the problem with the two brothers is that they didn't understand how good it was to be in the father's house. Neither of them understood. One got far away from it, ruined his wealth. The other stayed right there, ruined his wealth. They didn't understand how good, it was, how good it was to be in the house of their father. And that's the same mistake we all make. It's the same lie that Satan has been telling us ever since he convinced Adam and Eve that God was holding out on us and that the world had something better to offer. But I think some of these brothers who wrote the Psalms, they understood. I want to close here. I don't have a large point here explaining, you know. I'm just going to read these scriptures that talk about how good and wonderful it is to be in the presence of God. Because that's what I want to convince you of today. Not to not worship mammon. Not to not squander your wealth. I'm just trying to highlight for you what you have what you're in possession of. The father said, he said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. He meant those words. And God is saying those words to us. So let's listen. Let's consider what I'm about to read and let's embrace with earnestness and sincerity these words of God. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, it even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. This goes right back to the living streams to the river that goes and bring life. We don't just sit in the house of God like the older brother. We go live wildly, but we take his blessings and we heal the world. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked.
Isn't that what the younger brother said? I can go be a servant than stay here in this squalor. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He brings warmth, life, protection, safety, and peace. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Psalm 73, 23 through 26. Yet I am always with you. Isn't that what the older brother said? Well, that's what his father said to him. You have always been with me. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Isn't that what the disciples said? Where else will I go? Where else would I go? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 23, we'll close out here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. How many of us want to experience that restoration? He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I love that. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, surely, goodness and love will follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of God forever. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray today that we can recognize that your son died for a reason, that he did not suffer. He was not beaten just because but he allowed himself to go through it all and to be hung on the cross. He allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be spilled so that we could be in your house forever. So that we could each be redeemed. So that we could share in your inheritance. I pray that we can contemplate that today. And not even just the sacrifice that Jesus made, but why he made it. That he believed your presence in your house was so good, so wonderful, so valuable. And he wanted all of us to have a chance to be with you forever. Help us to see that value and embrace it. In your son Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.